Welcome to the Lone Wolf's Bikes and BS podcast and video series. We're going to be sitting down with pro athletes, engineers, and lots of other industry veterans to talk about BS, bikes, the evolution, history, and where the future of riding might be going. And of course, anything else that works its way into the conversation. Come along and enjoy the ride. It's been really cool to see what you guys have done here um, and, and what you've done with this business, right? I mean, I feel like so many of the the brands in the bike industry are just, you know, you almost look at them as like a mega corporation, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the bike world is still relatively small, but when you first started, how many bikes did you make? That was 15 years ago? Yeah. How many bikes did you make in year one? Well, that's a good one, because all I can remember, I got to think back on that. I can remember the very first batch that we created, and it was about 450 bikes. Okay. And I can remember everything before that was, um, and maybe I ought to st um, step back for a second and, and um, tell a little bit of why I, I got into this. Mm -hmm. um, I was, um, uh, my background is I'm actually, uh, I, I have a law degree and an MBA degree and I lived in California and I had, uh, I was working for Nissan Motor Corporation at the time, loved biking, but that was paying the bills. And, um, and uh, as it so happened, I had somebody call me up and said, hey, um, there's a guy named Lee Iacocca, he's starting another company. Would you like to come and um, meet with him? And um, I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to meet with him. And I don't know if you know Lee Iacocca, but he was, uh, just to give a little bit of background, um, he was chairman and CEO of Ford Motor Corporation. In fact, he got so kind of high up in Ford um, um, that even the Ford family apparently was a little bit nervous of him. And so he was famously fired from Ford. And, um, and he joined then um, Chrysler, who was on the verge of bankruptcy. And um, they had, uh, uh, he, he, you know, famously worked for $1 a year. And um, so he was able to turn Chrysler around. He's known for, by the way, he was credited with um, creating the Mustang, mm -hmm. the minivan. Um, um, and a lot of famous cars, you know, that came out of there. Um, and so anyway, he had retired from those. He was living in Southern California where I was at um, with Nissan. And um, he said, um, next thing you know, I found myself sitting across the desk from him and hearing what he was doing. And he was starting a new electric vehicle company. And um, this uh, company was um, called EV Global Motors. And one of their first products was an electric bicycle. In fact, the name e-bike was actually trademarked by EV Global Motors. They released the patent years ago, but um, that was their trademark at wow. the time. And um, so I was um, an attorney, business man at Nissan. I'm sitting here listening to this kind of this business icon. And I, and I looked and I said, okay, I can see where I'm gonna go with this, but I don't know where I would be going with this. That kind of sounds interesting. I'm young, why don't I try it out? And so I ended up um, jumping and, and um, working with him in this company. And I started really in just a kind of a sales role in the company. Um, and I think that's kind of where they're interested in me is because I was, I'd had experience of setting up dealer networks. Um, and so, we were going out setting up a bicycle dealership network. But in typical fashion, he didn't want to do it like anybody else. He didn't want to go through bicycle dealers. He wanted to go through car dealerships. And that you know, had some good issues, bad issues. There were different things that were because of that. But anyway, we were rolling along on that one. And, and um, one thing led to another. And I eventually became president of his company. And um, we were driving from his home in Bel Air to his home in uh, uh, Palm Springs and it was one of those long drives where you can only you know you talk about all your business stuff and then it kind of gets into more personal stuff mm -hmm. and um, and I can remember saying to him well look I know why I'm doing this uh, I don't have any money um, but why are you doing this you got more money and you know what to do with 
and he laughed and he said, I've, uh, you know, I can, um, you can only do so much golf. So, oh, okay, good, good. And so we parted. He actually went on a vacation for a month. Um, and then he came back and we'd been communicating in between there and, you know, different things. And, and, um, but he, when he came back, he grabbed me and he said, Hey, I know why I'm doing, I, I've been thinking a lot about what you said. And I agree with you. And I look back and I was thinking, what? I don't remember what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, Cause we'd talked about many things since then. He says, you're right. I'm going to sell the company. And um, I was like, Oh, okay. Um, and um, he says, you're welcome to buy it if you want. And, and you know, typical, uh, you know, he, he wanted to get a lot out of it. I didn't have the money to pay for it. So I helped him sell it. We found, um, uh, there was one company back East that was um, very interested in us, but they um, come to find out they really weren't interested in the company. They were more interested in us. And I said, well, that's a conflict of interest. I'm here on his dime. Um, ended up helping him sell the company to somebody else. And afterwards, you know, a few months later, we continued the conversation and um, I ended up joining that company back in Washington, DC. And it was fabulous, it was fun. Um, it was, we were going nonstop. Um, mm -hmm. I was traveling most of the year and I was missing everything. I mean, soccer games, you know, baseball games, piano recitals, what you name it. And the guilt was more than I could even handle after a while you know um i was always going out to eat different things meetings all the time and all i wanted when i got home i can remember thinking was man i just want a peanut butter sandwich that would just be so cool yeah and um and of course when i got home all my wife wanted was i gotta get out of the house i'm so sick of being here and right. so you know um one of those times i remember um, getting on a plane, just crossing the threshold and saying, man, I can't do this anymore. I'm missing everything with my family and all of, of that. And so that was the basis and the point that I started Fazari. Okay. Um, and so it was one of those uh, things, a, a turning point in life for me where I saw an opportunity. I mean, I've always loved biking, but the first question somebody will ask is, well, um, so you like biking, so you started a bike company. I guess it's like, you know, using the golf metaphor. Oh, so you like golfing, so you started a golf company? No, I saw an opportunity in the bike industry too. Right. And, um, and it's where I'd had some experience. And so I, I started with that. And we had, um, I literally just locked myself up and started with square one, just building the company from scratch. Um, whether it was designing the bikes, photographing the bikes, uh, you know, um, and marketing sales, but, you know, I um, mean, uh, manufacturing them, all of those things. I mean, there's so many different aspects of it, even to the point of with my legal background, writing the, uh, the owner's manuals, you know. Yeah. So um, it was fun. It was exciting. It was it was really good and there was almost this intellectual kind of an educational thing of doing it all the way along in fact i had thought for sure i needed to get an investor and um and so i had written a business plan and i had several people that were interested in it surprising to me um and they um and i was about ready to commit with one of them and as i was walking um out left you know drove to the place and was walking out of my car. I talked to my wife who called me on the phone and said, well, this sounds like a big day. Are you going to go through it? How do you feel? And I said, I don't know. I just don't know how I really feel about this. She goes, well, then trust your gut. We'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what happened. I turned it down and we just bootstrapped it. And um, that has been um, really, my wife has been fantastic through all of this. I mean, so supportive on everything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get into hard things, that's always, I, I always love that aspect of, of looking back and saying, well, things were always harder at one point. I mean, I could be away from my family or any of those things. So to the question that you just asked about, um, you know, the first order of bikes, the first things that I did, I designed these, I'd done them all. Everything seemed, you know, it was like, okay, it's not real yet mm -hmm. until, 
um, I went to the factory and I saw hundreds of bikes being created there. And all of a sudden I thought, oh wow, this is actually happening. <laughs> And um, that was uh, that was a scary moment, but an exciting moment too. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the start of you know how Fazari came about. Where how'd you come up with the name? That's a great question. <laughs> it's a it's a made up name. Yeah. But it has personal meaning to me. Okay. Because of um, kind of the roots of the name of how we made it up. Um, the last part of the name is actually a, a Japanese derivative of to be. And my undergraduate was, um, degree was in Japanese. Um, and so I have always through my life, not to say that I've done this, but it's always been a goal of mine to be in the moment mm -hmm. and not to be worrying about the past. You can waste so much time worrying about the past or frankly worrying about tomorrow because a lot of um, the tomorrows will take care of themselves if you worry about today and you stay in the moment. And so Fazari in and of itself means to be in the moment. And, and so that's kind of what we, we always preach here at this company. Um, and, and the things that we try to do is, is to say, look, focus on what you can control. Don't worry about the things that you can't control. There's a million things in the world today. There's a thousand things that you can get worried about. You know, we all can. Mm -hmm. And, um, and certainly we want to do whatever we can, but at the same time, um, worry about those things that you can control and do the best that you can in those. And, and that's kind of been the essence of it and, you know, foundation of the name. Very cool. And um, how did that first year in those 450 bikes move? So they went really well. Um, Where did you enough, sell them? So that's a great question. So as I was starting this company, I had a good friend that was actually a buyer. Um, I, I, I had my ideas of how we were gonna sell these. But a friend of mine called me and he said, and he was a buyer at Costco. And he said, hey, um, uh, we'd be interested in, in getting some bikes. You know anybody, I know you are in the industry, anybody that would be willing to sell some bikes to us? And I said, well, as it so happens, I'm actually doing a line of them. Well, show me what you got and we, we can, you know, do it. And, um, or, or look at it is, you know, what they, what they did. And so I, you know, we went back and forth a few times. And so we ended up selling that first batch through Costco okay. and we sold a lot through Costco. We didn't sell them in the store themselves. These were sold online and through road shows okay. because they were, even at that, a lot of those bikes that were sold in Costco, you know, they're two, three, $400 bikes. And our entry level bike was 650 up to $900. And so I think surprising to me and surprising to them, they both sold well, but um, I still couldn't sleep well at night. Okay. And one of the reasons was it's hard when you have one customer and, and you start thinking, man, what if this customer um, goes away, just calls me up tomorrow and says, we're done. Yeah. You know, and I just couldn't, I couldn't live with that. You know, I had to figure out ways to diversify a little bit. And so um, in my mind, I started saying, I gotta get back to the dealer network. And we've gotta start establishing a traditional uh, model. But how do you compete against the big brands, these mega brands? How do you get shelf space out there? How do you get anybody to even look at you? you mm -hmm. know? And so in my mind, I said, well, the way we're gonna do it is, we'll customize these things a little bit. We'll, will work on the fitting process because um, I had this habit, in fact, it's gotten even worse, of as, you, as I'll be going along either riding my own bike or driving along someplace and I'll look at people on bikes and say, man, that looks uncomfortable. Oh, that doesn't look right. Or, you know, and, and, yeah. and I thought, well, this is our in. We can fit a lot of these things better. Well, as I started pitching this to dealers, most of them started going, well, that's a lot of work. Uh, you know, that even makes me just give pain in my neck even thinking about that. So I started to say, you know what, I'm going to prove the model. I'm going to see if it can work. And then after we get it to work, they'll come back to me and they'll start talking to me. And so that's kind of what we did um, is we started with that, the, the kind of the custom setup aspect of it. And what was great is, is a lot of the customers, uh, well, we sold a lot of bikes that way. Mm -hmm. 
And we started to diversify away from Costco and some of, of these things. And, um, and then the dealers started to come and, and by the way, in those days, we were looked at as, what are you, fish or fowl? You know, nobody, it's kind of cool to say you sell direct now. Right. But back then, no, you were, what? You were weird. You yeah. know, there's, um, I mean, it was hard to get um, brands at that point to talk to us, for example. Um, yeah. You know, like suppliers. Uh, right. And, and so it was, it was a hard slog. Um, you know, to, to go through that, but we just kept persisting and doing it. Anyways, we started to grow more up and as it, we we're fleshing out the product line, it just became more and more apparent that it wasn't a fit um, to sell in Costco, you know? And so we, we ended that relationship and, and we just started to develop the direct model. And as the dealers started to come, we kind of looked back and said, you know what, we can do this. We're just gonna, we're gonna do this new way that we have figured out. You know, whatever avenue you take is gonna be hard. The critical thing is, is that you stick with it and that you really push through and mm -hmm. you do the best that you can in that, you know, what you've chosen. And that's, that's been a lot of what we've done with this model is we've, we've looked at the things that we can control and the things that we can't control and we start to say, okay, how can we remove some of those barriers to maybe bring those in to where we can control those a little bit more. And so that's where we started with the 23 point custom setup, right. where we will take all the measurements for our customer and, and just um, build the bike to their specifications. And then that led to, well, if you're doing that, can you just custom build a bike for me? Yeah, we can do that. And so we, we started to custom build bikes for, you know, whatever a person wants. Um, and then we've talked about, you know, the, the whole, Love it or return it guarantee. Uh, just a lot of those things that we're, we're, you know, able to kind of remove those barriers and instill the confidence of somebody of, you know, that's in, you know, some other part of the country or some other part of the world of how we're gonna sell to them. And, 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 it, and really it is about just establishing a relationship, however we do that mm -hmm. with the customer. It seems like the, you know, there's a pretty deep story in, in just different avenues and that diversification and finding out who you guys are yeah who you're going to sell to what's going to stand you apart from other brands yeah um were there moments in this cycle right where you were waking up at night stressed unsure if you were going to be able to sell the bikes or make enough to to keep the business going yeah or, or were you always in, in a pretty solid growth pattern since you started Great questions. Um, yes, there, uh, there are always points that you'll wake up in the night and start to stress, you know, and, and I have, it's something that's been a lifelong thing for me. I'm an overachiever. I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. Um, and um, I'm always trying to do the best possible that we can. And, and so we always talked about being uh, profitable from day one. I wanted to create a sound company. We've done things a little bit different than is kind of the cool thing in the world today of, hey, bring on a ton of debt, a ton, ton of investment, and then run at a negative for a long time until you get a huge market share. And then hopefully you get a buyout or, or, or some other thing, you know? Right. And, um, you know, our philosophy has always been, no, you know what? We're building this for the long haul. Right. Um, and it's, it's always, it, it in some ways, it's felt disingenuous for me uh, as representing the brand if we had some ulterior motive. You mm -hmm. know, if somebody was looking to buy a bike from me and spending $5,000, and I mean, I would get the question in the very beginning, man, are you going to be around for me to service this bike in a year or two or three years? And, and I'd have to really go back and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be around. Yeah. And, you know, there were a couple of times, I, there was one time in particular where I was just, I woke, uh, I don't know what it was. It was probably, unfortunately it was probably around in April when you know we're all doing our taxes. Yeah. And it was one of those times where I was, and this was years ago, and I can remember looking at this and, and just kind of just throwing the papers up and going, what on earth am I doing here? I've wasted the best years of my life is what I felt like at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, it, it ended up being 
a real uh, turning point for me to go back in and refocus on it because, um, you know, I couldn't just walk away from it. I couldn't quit. Yeah. I'm done. I'm out of here. You know, I had customers. I had obligations. I had, you know, everything. And so, um, you know, at, at that point, I kind of thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'm going to sell this company. Um, but I got to pretty it up to sell it. And um, then come to find out that nobody, you know, people, if they wanted to buy it, they didn't really want to buy it. What they wanted to do is buy into it, you know. And, um, and there was a, a point along that line of where I just kind of was looking at it and saying, um, we ha I had to make some critical decisions of, man, do I act as if the money is in the company or not? in the company or not. And, um, and we just acted, literally went forward as in you know, faith of like, hey, we're acting as if it's all in. And we, that's, that's how we, we did it. And so that, that was like a turning point when you, turning with that, point. that mental shift of saying, yep. you know what you need to do now, we gotta act yep. like we can make it happen. Yep, and, and we really did. We had some <clears throat> huge successes that happened from there. And, um, and we've been very fortunate, I mean, um, so you, you asked about the growth of Fazari and we've grown every single year. Mm -hmm. Um, although the last several years has been like drinking from a fire hose. So yeah. what is, I guess your, your personal thoughts and beliefs as a business owner, as a person, as a leader for these crews and, and how these daily meetings yeah. help with, with accountability, integrity. I know, you know, Tyler has shown us these banners that you guys have yeah. and how they're kind of foundational blocks of your business. Yeah. So tell us what those blocks are and what they mean to the team and yourself. You know, it, it's funny. I love the fact that we have an absolute diverse workforce here. I mean, they come from every walk of life. I'm sure, I have no idea, but I'm sure there's all the political spectrum here. There's all the, you know, everybody likes different things. They probably all have different hobbies or, and, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and different things that they do. But one area that I know that we all intersect on very much so is a love of bikes. And, but to run a company, you gotta have a little bit more than that. I mean, just to have a love of bikes is, is great. I mean, that's a foundational thing. And, and that's one of the things that we'll ask in, a, in an interview is, man, you gotta love bikes. It's gonna make it a lot easier to work here. Right. But, um, <laughs> but there's, it's, it's, we're always looking for, one of the principal things that we say is, is You'll enjoy working here if you can leave your ego at the door and bring your ideas, but we don't care where the ideas come from. They can come from anybody. They can come from a high school kid around behind, which we just had um, the, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Some you know, high school kid was in here working and he goes, hey, have you guys ever thought of this? And I think people looked around and like, it's actually a great idea. You know? And so we changed something. And, and so we're, it's always about continuous improvement we're trying to do things better but we're not going to change the world overnight mm -hmm. and so you know it's it's about doing a little bit better every day and you know we'll tie that back into um the bike industry itself and biking of you know one pedal stroke at a time mm -hmm. you're never going to get to the top of that mountain by stressing on it mm -hmm. the way you're going to get to it is by starting to pedal and uh, all of us who are bikers you've been on steep climbs before where you're like, oh man, I'm not gonna make that. But if you get in and you just start taking it a step at a time and you, you know, break it down into little things of, of like, okay, I'm just gonna get to that point and then to that point and to that point. And that's kind of what we've done as a company is, is do some of those things. We are always trying to focus on the positive of everything we do. That doesn't mean that we're not looking at ways to improve, but if you, if you go in Everybody can point out a thousand things that you're doing wrong. And if you dwell on that, man, you just get into this mindset of you're not doing anything right. Right. Um, and so we always start this routine of, hey, what are three good things that we did today or yesterday? And, and we will start with those. It kind of gets the juices flowing. It puts people in a, a positive mindset. And then we'll say, okay, what's one thing we can work on? And it's always this three to one ratio that we try to do. And um, it's great, we'll do that. And, um, and then the next thing that we always talk about is a principle. So we have a required reading list to even be an employee here at Fazari. You gotta, 
you got to read some some certain books and these are just books on our mindset you know of this is what we're trying to do here this is what we're trying to accomplish we don't just create an acceptable experience acceptable is good that's fine but we're trying to create an exceptional experience and so think outside of the box what are you going to do to make it ex exceptional now for us, candidly, I mean, if you're looking at it at a pure business level, yeah, that's way easier for us to gain customers because if we create exceptional experiences for customers, it's going to make them that much more likely to recommend us to others and it, we can grow the business. But fundamentally, it's more about who we are. And that's what I like the most is, is, is look, go through your life and be exceptional at whatever you're doing. I mean, be the best that you can at whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're designing a bike or if you are, um, you know, stocking shelves or pulling bikes or you're in logistics or, um, you know, any, anything. I mean, I'm mentioning things in our company itself, but outside of the company, whatever you're doing, you know, be the best at it that you can possibly be and, and make it good for somebody else. Right on. Well, where is that pursuit leading you next? What What is coming down the bike pipeline for Fazari? Maybe not just models, but yeah, just yeah. beyond. We do have a, a five-year plan of okay. what we've got coming out on the product side, which I know is is one of the things. Um, and And we've got some really cool products. I mean, just, I, I can't even... Now I lose sleep about some of those. I'm, you know, how do we get them quicker to market? Um, but, and that's, a, that's really exciting. Um, but the, the other side of it is, is, okay, how do we continue to do this mission almost that we're talking about with Fazari of, of creating these exceptional experiences? And, and um, one of the things that I have been, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that, uh, you know, right when I started this, I mean, I was doing everything on my own. Mm. And one of the hardest things to do was to give up some of those things, you know, yeah. because initially you're always thinking, well, oh, I can do that a little better. I mean, I, I, just because of experience, I've done this. Um, but I've learned um, to hire the best people, get people smarter than yourself. And, um, and really what I see for us as a company is, we continue to just uh, um, try to get the best people and, and given things. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best biker, for example. Mm. I mean, they might be the best at, um, they might have a love of bikes, but they've got a passion for something else that they can help us bring this in and help us with, you know, web marketing, for example, or, or, or what other yeah. avenue we're, we're involved in. But I look at myself as, as, um, as really, managing the team and helping that team to grow and if I, I i love to get down in the weeds i love to be in the details to um but i also have to realize that i got to pull back on some of those things and allow you know and and that's one of the things that we always try to do is allow healthy mistakes in the company of uh for people to grow yeah. and learn um so that we can continue to progress right on well thank you Appreciate it. I feel like I could sit here for another couple hours and pick your brain and try to learn a few things, but uh, appreciate, you know, the hospitality and showing us around and uh, all the employees here seem to really enjoy working, working for the brand. And it seems like it's, like you said, more than just a bike brand, right? It's, it's yeah. kind of part of the, the way of life and a, and a passion that runs deep. So yeah. um, congrats on that and uh, look forward to seeing more cool stuff and, and bikes coming out. Cool. Love to have you back when we have some of these new ones. Um, in fact, we got some new ones coming out really soon, so. Yeah, we do, huh? Yeah. <laughs> got to ride one yesterday, that was a lot of fun. That was cool. So make sure you stay tuned for that. <laughs>